and we will we'll hover in a long passage, Jeremiah 30 through 33. Um, but I want to start this morning uh, in a little bit of a unique way for uh, our sermon time. Um, I, I want to start out with a discussion question because I, I want you to start processing this uh, before I start saying anything. Um, and so I'd like for you to discuss this with the people around you. Um, and as your group sort of discusses, discusses? That's not the word I was looking for. Uh, discusses. Uh, be listening for the, the best answer in your group. And then, um, and then we'll share a few of these kind of with the congregation as a whole. And here's the question. Um, what is the difference? What is the difference between positive thinking and Christian hope? What is, the th what is the difference between positive thinking and Christian hope? To ask it in a slightly different way, what is the difference between thinking positively and having hope as a follower of Jesus? Let's take a few minutes to, to discuss this together. All right, let's start to, to wrap them up and we'll hear maybe a couple responses. Hey, Alex. Would you, would you run this around for me? Thanks, man. Um, is there a group that has, has a response, has an answer? Something that they like to... <laughs> I feel like Matt should have to start. <laughs> well, I'll say real quick, one, uh, one of the things we, we talked about was that, that positive thinking uh, doesn't, doesn't really have have the hope of, of the promises of, of God. Um, and so it's, it's uh, just a way of, of kind of dealing with, with circumstances rather than looking forward to what God has for us. Cool. Anyone else? All right. One of the first things we said was that uh, positive thinking was from yourself, mm. trying to mm. make it all better, mm. where the hope is you know, you give it up to, to God, and you know inside mm. that it's truth. Cool. And uh, so I think that's the biggest difference. Thanks, Gene. We had a unique, uh, well, everybody knows how giddy Curtis is all the time, right? <laughs> so that <laughs> is the mentality that I'm trying to achieve as well. Because he based <laughs> everything on that one belief, right? So that was, a, that was like a living example, so. Okay, as we discussed that back here, I think it was a unanimous feeling that positive thinking comes from us. Hope comes from somebody else. And regardless of what happens, with hope we can trust God who made everything in the first place and, and has, our, uh, has us in line. So I would rather trust God when I know it's going to happen than have positive thinking and act like it's going to, but it doesn't. Hmm. Thanks, Don. Positive thinking is trying to control a situation, and Christian faith is giving it away. Anybody in this section? Matt. <laughs> How'd you switch sections? That's awesome. Okay, this is good. This is a good start for us. Thanks, guys. Um, before, before I ask this question, I, I don't know if you have ever given any thought to there being a difference between positive thinking and Christian hope. Um, and maybe even after hearing a couple responses, like you still may not be convinced that there is some difference. Or if there is a difference, maybe you're wondering like why it matters. It, is it just splitting hairs? Just to kind of get us on the same page, uh, let me offer just a quick definition that is gonna sort of piggyback some of the ones that we've already heard. Um, but positive thinking is mostly self-explanatory, right? It, it's, about, it's about thinking good thoughts. It's also about ignoring or countering 
bad thoughts with good thoughts. And so it's maybe best summarized or captured in the phrase, right? I can do it. Christian hope is different. Christian hope is an orientation toward the promises of God, the promises that God has made in and through Jesus Christ. Christian hope is, is living in light of uh, what Jesus has done and is doing. It's about remembering that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's about living with the truth that God is making all things new. Um, in many ways, <laughs> uh, sort of funny that Sean uh, said what he said, because this sermon is super personal for me. Uh, this is the distinction that I have struggled to learn. Because, believe it or not, I may have a bit of a reputation for positivity. Uh, positivity seems to come uh, naturally for me in a way that pessimism comes naturally for others. Uh, not, not pessimism, uh, what do you call it? Realism is what our pessimists would say. <laughs> a a well-known research company um, has this personal strengths assessment that you can take. And this, this company has identified what they think are the 34 distinct strengths that people share among themselves. And, and we all have them at various levels. And, and I've taken this test twice, <laughs> years apart, and both times positivity was one of my top five uh, themes. And then just this week at camp, I had a camp counselor uh, tell me that I might be one of the most positive people that she's ever met. And then a camper told me that, that, uh, that my positive way of disagreeing was so disarming that it actually helped her to hear uh, some point that I was making. Which might make you think, right? Okay, so what in the world is wrong with positive thinking? Well, there are two dangers that I've experienced personally. The first danger can show up in my leadership. Uh, a few years ago, a couple years ago, uh, when, when Laura finished her time, fracking, finished her time on the board, um, one of the bits of feedback that she gave me had to do with my positivity. She warned me that my, my positive, it's all gonna work out thinking, could easily spin real and critical concerns into less important issues that don't need to be considered. And so since then, I've been warning our church board to just watch for this in me. The second danger with my positive thinking is that if I confuse positive thinking with Christian hope, then I spend too much time trying to think positively and not enough time receiving God's gift of hope. Because as several of you uh, have alluded to, there's this real sense that positive thinking is something that emerges in us that we will, whereas Hope is something that is a gift from God. And this is really the biggest difference between the two. Positive thinking is really, in our day, the like, it's like the heartbeat, the lifeblood of the self-help culture. It's something that you do to make your life better. But Christian hope, is a gift that we have been given. It, it is the very center of our faith in Jesus. And very often, Christian hope is actually still something you do, but rarely does it make your life better, at least in the ways that we often sort of want better lives, right? If you, if you spent the week uh, worshiping through uh, the daily worship guide. Um, you spent this week exploring this very idea. And, and we just read the whole story uh, just a few minutes ago as well. In Jeremiah chapter 32, there, there's a prophet named Jeremiah who is locked away in prison. And he's been locked away in prison because he has been bold in announcing terrible news for the people. But while he is in prison, the Lord speaks to Jeremiah and he tells Jeremiah to do something sort of very unexpected. 
Jeremiah, I want you to purchase some property. Now, we've all had people tell us that God told them to purchase property. But strangely, I don't know anybody who's ever purchased property for this reason. Jeremiah is being called to put his money where his hope is. And it's truly insane. It it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever because Jeremiah is in prison. But it's way worse than that. There's an enemy army that has been marching toward Jeremiah's home, toward Jerusalem. And this army has begun to surround Jeremiah's people and the land that he was told to purchase. And Jeremiah, he knows exactly what's been going on. He's in jail for announcing this actual thing, that God is going to allow this enemy to win, that Jeremiah's people are going to be crushed. They are going to lose everything they have, including this land that God just told him to buy. Jeremiah knows this. This is why he's in prison for announcing this very truth. He knows that for 70 years, everything, even this land is going to be in possession of a foreign power. Jeremiah will never live on the land that he is purchasing. But God tells him, hey, I've got some land for you to buy. Sounds like a swamp salesman in Florida. See, positive thinking says stuff like, if I work hard enough, if I believe hard enough, if I want it bad enough, I will be able to buy a house to live in. But there is absolutely no amount of positive thinking that could ever convince you to buy a house that you know you'll never live in and that you know will sit occupied for two generations by your enemies. Positive thinking sets out to change our circumstances in light of what we want, but Christian hope changes us in light of who God is and what he is doing. I hear this question asked a lot, not necessarily just in our church, but just in general among Christians. Why doesn't the church look any different from the world? Well, I think this is one of those places where we could look incredibly different. Uh, The truth is there are optimists and pessimists in the church and in the world. Uh, Optimism and pessimism don't seem to be so much spiritual states as much as personality types. And so you can find them in the church and in the world. But, but only the church has people who have Christian hope. And so who should be doing things that demonstrate that hope, things that make completely no sense whatsoever to people who don't have that hope. And doesn't Jeremiah look different? when he expresses his hope in God's promises, when when people ask Jeremiah, right? Because you have to imagine that people are asking Jeremiah, what in the world are you doing? You are the one telling us we're about to be destroyed. But Jeremiah is about to have this powerful word that accompanies his life. So when people say, why are you so weird, Jeremiah? Why do you do weird things? He can say, after our enemies have destroyed us, God will bring our people back here. And you know what? Nobody, nobody would look at Jeremiah and go, huh, I wonder if that guy really believes. Do you think Jeremiah really believes what he says? How often is that question get asked of Christians today. I I wonder if he really believes what he says. I wonder if she really believes. Jeremiah is showing it. He's living it. Just how deep his trust is as he hopes for what God has promised. 
But I think that the church far too often settles for a counterfeit hope. We, we, we are too attracted to a cheap knockoff that's known as positive thinking. And so the church in our, in our messages, in our messaging, in our living sounds like any random self-help book that you might pull off a shelf at Barnes and Noble. God wants you to have your best life now. Just look in the mirror every day and tell yourself that today will be a great day. Everything will work out for you. These aren't rooted in Christian hope. This is positive thinking. Using this morning's passage, um, we can look at and we can actually see where we've let people sort of come around the church and take our Bible and use it against us, convincing us to set our Christian hope aside in order to replace it with positive thinking. So these chapters uh, that we have reviewed this week, chapters 30 through 33, um, they're often considered like the lone bright spot in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, while, while most of Jeremiah is focused on, on the judgment that's coming to Judah, these four chapters, they focus on, on the better future that God has promised. So that in this book, which we've noticed so far and we're going to keep noticing after this week is fairly dark, is often super sad, is consistently disturbing. These four chapters include some of the most positive and comforting verses in the entire Bible, which might surprise you because we read a chunk that wasn't so positive and encouraging. Um, but, let, but let's like run through these chapters just, just for a quick survey. And so if you turn with me to chapter 30, Starting in verse 3, we hear Jeremiah say, For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people. Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Jump down to verse 11. For I am with you, to save you, declares the Lord. Jump down to verse 17. I will restore health to you, and your wounds I will heal, declares the Lord. Verse 19. We read, out of them shall come songs of thanksgiving and the voices of those who celebrate. I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will make them honored, and they shall not be small. Verse 22, and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Chapter 31, verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you and you shall be built. Verse 8, Behold, I will bring them from the north country. I will gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman, and she who is in labor together, this great company, and they shall return here. Verse 9, the end of verse 9, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Verse 12. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, the oil, over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden, and they shall languish no more. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. Verse 25. Oh, sorry, I jumped too far ahead. Verse 17. 
There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Verse 20, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he my darling child? For as often as I speak against him, I do remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. 25, for I will satisfy the weary soul and every languishing soul I will replenish. If we are honest, how much more did you enjoy me running through those verses than our three longer sections earlier that had some unpleasantness in them? I mean, what we just read, it like connects with us immediately. I will restore you. I am with you to save you. I will restore your health, your wounds. I will heal. I will multiply you. I will build you. I will gather my people from the farthest parts of the earth. I will satisfy the weary soul. Oh, it feels so good. And you could probably hear immediately why these are people's favorite verses from Jeremiah. And there are so many resources out there, speakers and books and sermons and devotionals that, that take these verses and turn them into tools essentially for positive thinking. Just think about these verses. Just read these verses and your life will turn around, they say. Let these verses, even just take key words from them and let them sort of become a mantra for you and you'll discover that things are just going differently. Restore, save, multiply, build, satisfy. I know somebody recently who their word for the year was multiply and so for them, they just let that word keep sort of working in them. And so they assumed that, that God wanted to and was going to multiply something in them because this was the word. And they began to put their hope in that word in some weird ways. But this is a cheap substitute for Christian hope. These verses are about hope. They are absolutely about hope, but they only offer hope within the context of the chapters. And they only provide hope within the context of the larger story being told, the larger thing that God is up to and doing. There's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. And in the fourth chapter, he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And, and I've heard people take this verse and use it as a biblical justification for positive thinking. And it's just dumb. Like it has to be. Because the rest of this letter written by Paul is about how Paul is in prison and he's suffering for Christ and he's completely content suffering f whatever is before him. Like there is nothing like positive thinking going on in Paul's letter, but the letter that Paul wrote is about hope, Christian hope, in who Jesus is and what Jesus has promised. Christian hope is fixing your life, orienting your life toward the things that God has said he will do. And so Paul's point is that you, you can't just pull out parts of scripture that you like and then that make you feel extra comfortable, that help you feel better about yourself uh, and about your life and think about them only. No, if it's true, you need to think about this. If it's just, you need to think about it and on and on and on. And this is the larger story that's being told in Jeremiah. So God's people are suffering when, when Jeremiah speaks these words of hope to them. 
But they're not just suffering for no reason. They are suffering the real and the painful consequences of their, of their actions. They have sinned. They have sinned. And their sin is destroying them. But God has not abandoned them in their sin. And God, over time, is going to work on their behalf. And while God is at work, he is going to ask his people to trust him with deliberate acts of hope. And this brings us then to, in some ways, the three, the three things, I guess, uh, that I, I want you to know about Christian hope. Like if you take away anything this morning, um, I, I hope it's these three characteristics of Christian hope these three characteristics that set it apart from positive thinking. The first is that Christian hope is honest. Christian hope is honest. Christian hope has horizons. And third, Christian hope is hands-on. I gave them all H's for you for ease of remembering. Uh, remember Memory, remembering, there we go. Christian hope is honest. Christian hope has horizons. Christian hope is hands on. The honesty of Christian hope, it should be sort of obvious, but it's not. In a world that's obsessed with positive thinking, even the church, even in the church, we don't place great value on confessing our sin. In fact, this is one of maybe the greatest examples of how fully the church has adopted positive thinking as a replacement for Christian hope. Um, we read a book like the Bible uh, generally or Jeremiah specifically, books that are filled with the sins of God's people. And then we say things like, you know, we just shouldn't focus on the past. Like, why, why, why should we spend time thinking about our sins? Like, that's so negative. I mean, the book that God gave us, like, is, it, it, I mean, we might, might as well just call it, like, a book of sin. Like, it, it kind of is that for God's people. I, I, we should just honor our brothers and sisters who, uh, who uh, grew up, Jewish and who gave us this text because why would they keep this? Why would they keep reading this and sharing this, right? Like this is God's people warts and all. And we say stuff like, that's in the past. We shouldn't focus on our sins. Why, why do we make such a big deal about the church's failures? What good does it do to, to dig up the past? It's dead, it's buried, it's gone. But the Bible seems to be convinced. The, the one who breathes through the Bible seems to be convinced that our sin, that looking at our sin is, is a pretty good way to become and stay humble. <laughs> The Bible also seems to recognize that, that looking at our sin is a good way to just marvel at God's grace. And as we look at Israel's story, by the time we get to Jesus, we just go, God, how have you not given up on them yet? How is it that you would die for them? Which of course then invites us to this beautiful place of saying, how in the world would you die for me? And then every time we sin after that, there is some value. Recognizing that God forgives our sins and doesn't hold them against us anymore, there does seem to be some value of keeping a record for the sake of learning from our mistakes and celebrating God's grace. See, God has no problem bringing sin into the light. 
And he seems to relish a little bit in inviting us to look at it, to reflect on it, to learn from it, to see his amazing ability to overcome it, to see him forgiving it, to see him redeeming it and even transforming it. Do you know who doesn't want to look at sin? People who are still walking in it or want to walk in it and people who don't know how to live by grace. The danger of looking at sin if you don't know how to live by grace is that every time you see it, you hide in shame, which is a travesty. It means you don't know the gospel yet. Seeing our sin shouldn't send us into hiding, but should send us into the arms of the God who is gracious and merciful and who sent his son for us. But if we don't know grace, we won't want to talk about sin. But Paul confesses his sin, and so does Peter, and so does the early church, and, and so should we. Because true hope, Christian hope, is honest about our starting place. Because if we want to understand what God is going to do, we have to understand like what he needs to do, what he's starting with. And, and I love, if you read through Jeremiah 30 and 31, you just hear this honesty. It shows up in places like Jeremiah saying, your, your guilt is great. Your sins are flagrant. But honesty is about more than just sins. It's also about circumstances. This is something I heard several people name earlier. Jeremiah tells the people of Judah that they're gonna be in Babylon for 70 years. And, and so here's the truth. Here's the truth for, for God's people. If God says you're gonna be in Babylon for 70 years, how much positive thinking do you think you can do to change your circumstances? Right, like you can't think enough positive thoughts to, to get your parents to move. You can't think enough positive thoughts to get someone to be nice to you, to change, like if you're a teenager, your family's financial position. There's just a lot of positive thinking that can't do anything. Christian hope is about being honest about the conditions of our lives. Jeremiah is in prison <laughs> and these people are 100% going to be destroyed by their enemies. It is in the face of that truth that Jeremiah honestly declares his hope and his hope becomes even more powerful. He isn't trying to change reality. He's announcing God's future plans. The problem with the way that we so often pull out our favorite verses from these chapters is, is that they rob God's word of their honesty. All of these words that I, I sort of ran through are spoken into real contexts, real suffering, real pain, real issues that aren't gonna be changed anytime soon. Not by reading a single verse hoping that that helps you think more positively. When God says that he will restore their health, this comes on the heels of God saying that their, that their wound, that their pain is incurable. He speaks the truth. They have hard hearts but then he makes a promise that he is able to soften their hearts, to give them new hearts. We all like to believe that God is with us. But when God tells the people of Judah this, when he says to them, I'm with you, the truth is they don't feel his presence anymore. In fact, they have lost the visible sign of his presence in their midst. The temple, 
The glory of God burning in the temple was the sign. It was the truth that God is with you. And they have lost that and they feel like they've lost everything. And so God cannot be with us. But Jeremiah says, no, no, I am with you. Even though everything seems to say that I'm not. So can you hope in line with my promises? Positive thinking avoids talking about sin or looking at failure and it refuses to look at our circumstances. But Christian hope is honest about sin and it's honest about the conditions of our lives. Which brings us to the second characteristic of Christian hope. Hope has horizons. When God announces, I will be with you to save you, I want you to track with me here. He's making multiple promises. And each of these promises have their fulfillment at a different place in the future. So imagine you are a a Judah, Judahite. Oh, why do I keep picking words? I don't know how to say. Um, You are a person of Judah. There we go. Uh, In the city of Jerusalem and the, the enemy is surrounding you. On the closest horizon, God is promising that the Babylonians will not completely crush the people of Judah. Might not sound like a great promise, but he's saying, I am with you and I will save you from being utterly wiped out. You will have a future in your mere existence. But then there's a next horizon, the next mountain behind. God is promising that there will come a day in 70 years when he will release Judah from her captivity. God will save Judah from Babylon, rescuing his people from the penalty of their sin. On the next horizon, the next mountain rage back, God is promising that the sin that has kept Judah captive is finally gonna be dealt with. Right, because Israel's gonna go into Babylon and they're gonna come back, but we still realize the truth. Like their hearts still haven't been transformed. They are still enslaved to sin, even though they've been set free from Babylon. And so God is promising that he's going to deal with the sin. God is with them. God will come to be with his people in a profound and beautiful and unexpected way. And when he does, God will be called Yeshua. Or in Greek, Jesus, which means the Lord is our salvation because God has come to be with his people and to save them from the power of sin. And then there is the furthest horizon. God is promising that, that, that once and for all, he is going to remove sin from, from his creation altogether. God will dwell with his people powerfully and presently and sin will just no longer exist. And so God will save his people from the presence of sin. As you read through Jeremiah 30 through 33, you discover God is speaking to different horizons. One of the places where where Christians get confused by positive thinking is is in God's promises to heal his people. When we confuse the horizons, we can believe that we are further in the future than we are. And so I've heard too many Christians think that if they just think positive thoughts, if they just don't think about death, if they just keep repeating God's promises to heal, then, then they'll be healed. Or like, if you listen to it, sometimes it sounds like then they'll get lucky and survive a surgery or something. But like our Christian hope, our Christian hope according to the scriptures, is not that God will definitively guaranteed heal us today if we just have enough faith. God can absolutely heal us today. Scriptures give testimony to this. The church has bore witness to this through the last 2,000 years. God can heal today, but that is not our hope, friends. It's not our hope that God can heal today. Our hope is that God will heal 
heal us all one day. That on that final day, when all of the dead are raised to life with Christ, on that day, the day of perfect healing, we will all be healed. This is why Paul tells us that we can grieve the death of our loved ones with hope. This is why Christian funerals, if you, if you go back and you read different denominations, different tradition books, Christian funerals have been many Resurrection Sunday services. Because in the face of death and disease, the church sings and dances. I didn't know what dance I was going to do until just that moment, but this is it. <laughs> There's other great dances that you could do. And it, trust me, it sounds utterly offensive that we would sing with joy and dance with hope at a funeral. Right? It sounds insensitive to someone's deep loss, to the grief that people are experiencing. And that grief is real. Paul doesn't deny it, but we do not grieve as those without hope because we have a distinctively Christian hope that God will raise the dead. And so we look at death and we laugh in its face. We mock it. This is what the Christian funeral service is designed to do, is to be a communal announcement that death has lost its sting that the one who has raised the dead will raise this body and all of creation to new life. I mean, it is this proclamation that is so full of hope. When God heals in our day, and he does heal in our day, the truth is that that healing is not perfect. It is not a final healing. If you get healed, you better give God praise for that. But guess what? You're still going to die. <laughs> Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Every single person that Jesus healed, and even the one he raised from the dead, died again. When God heals, he does it for a reason. God heals to give people a glimpse of what is coming. Could you imagine spending all of your money on a taste of ice cream with a little taster scoop at Baskin Robbins? No, that's just a taste. It's a taste of the actual ice cream that you want to eat. But man, we make a big deal out of that taste. God does it to give people a glimpse of what is coming. God heals to show people a sign of his future and perfect healing. Positive thinking is all about changing my life according to my timeline. But Christian hope is about waiting with God as he transforms all of creation with his resurrection power. Finally, our third characteristic. I, I don't want to say too much about how Christian hope is hands-on, uh, mostly because um, many of you spent the week considering this as you work through the daily worship guide. Um, but our passage this morning gives us this powerful example of the hands-on nature of our hope. If you have Christian hope, you will do things that make zero sense to the world, like purchasing property that you and your family won't live on for more than 70 years, maybe. Jeremiah bought this piece of property that announced God's future plans. And, and so here's where I want to give us a, just a, another few minutes, and maybe those of you who did the Daily Worship Guide have already started thinking about this and can help, help the discussions in your groups. But to brainstorm a little bit together, in light of our Christian hope, what are the things that the church does? Like, what are the things that, that we, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, the saints, 
do that point our neighbors toward God's ultimate plans? What are the hands-on ways the church lives out and announces our hope? Let's talk about this for a few minutes. So we're, we're going to create a moment during our offering uh, to share some of these, these suggestions. Uh, but can I, can I move us to one of the things that we do that declares our hope? We gather around the table, the table of our Lord Jesus. We gather around the table of our Lord Jesus to declare our hope in him. Think about the table in light of what we have considered this morning. It's honest. The table is a place of honesty where we come recognizing that Jesus gave himself for our sins, where we recognize uh, our inability to uh, stay faithful to him and where we see his faithfulness in light of our unfaithfulness. The table is the place where we can be completely honest. Paul says, when it's time to come around the table, hey, we're a family, a family of reconciliation. Therefore, if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, you don't get to come to the table and pretend that that's not a thing. But we're a people of honesty. God has reconciled us with him and we carry out the ministry of reconciliation. And so we are honest about the fractures in our relationships with each other. So we're honest at the table. But this table also has horizons. Think about the stories that this table uh, declares. It starts with the meal that announces that God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. This meal, the Passover meal, declared that God was making promises to his people. Jesus then gathers with his disciples around that very same table and says, all of that meaning that it had, it still has that plus now, here I am offering you my body and my blood so that you might experience the freedom of the Exodus, but even greater because I'm setting you free from the power of sin and your fear of death. The horizons take us from the Exodus to the Last Supper and into the future. The great wedding feast of the Lamb when we will enjoy intimate communion with our God and Father, a celebration of what he has done in his new creation, creating and restoring this place for his people to dwell with him forever. Can you see the horizons in this hopeful meal? And then lastly, it's how hands-on is it? We touch the body of Christ and the blood of Christ it enters into us in a profound way. We, we rub shoulders with brothers and sisters, fellow sinners invited to the table. We declare our hope. Paul tells us that every time we eat this meal, we declare Christ's death until he returns. And so we have this sense that, this, that our participation in this announces that God has started something and he is not done with it. And so we eat here in order to have our imaginations transformed. If, if the final wedding feast of the Lamb is a place where people of every tongue, tribe, nation, language, uh, of every economic status, of every, every sort of grouping that we can ever create are all welcome at that table, we practice that here. This is something we do that, that visually demonstrates the nature of the kingdom of God, that hoped for, longed for promise that God is at work carrying out right now. I hope you're ready to eat this meal. What an incredible opportunity for us to declare the hope that we have in Christ. If our servers would come,